And, uh, so we have, do have a few patents for algorithms, but we really don't look at it as protection that's, you know, in case somebody tries to steal our software, uh, it's more a nice thing to do as opposed to protection. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, the international market in which you operate in, are there particular challenges there that you face in terms of proprietary uh, information that you have to deal with? Um, of course, there's, um, you know, different countries. Well, even in the U.S., I think if you look at the copyright type things, there is a kind of a laissez-faire attitude against copying songs and things of that nature. And you take that to China, and it's, it's even bigger. You know, they actually... They, they actually duplicate albums and software and put fake labels on them and sell them for a dime on the, you know, a dollar on the street. Um, and I think if you're dealing at that level, so if you, if for instance, write a, a game, um, you're probably going to want to distribute it through uh, uh, Electronic Arts or somebody that's going to take care of all the copyright and distribution problems. Uh, but for us, the, the type of companies that we sell to, uh, they're more concerned with having illegal bootleg software than we're actually concerned about them having it because it doesn't look good for a for a company to be audited and found to be having, you know, stolen software. So uh, even in China, I, I, you know, I, we don't even, we really don't worry about it too much. Uh, we make sure our contracts are good, so we do have a solid contract with our customers, and that contract um, uh, requires them to protect our software and not let it out to the hands of people that uh, shouldn't have it. Uh, but I, I go back to digital equipment deck, uh, who's now, I think, part of Hewlett Packard via Compaq. Um, they, uh, for years, uh, couldn't sell into Russia because we had a, we had a trade embargo with Russia, but uh, the Russians actually uh, reverse engineered their hardware and created their VMS operating system, and it was very, very popular in Russia. And then when the trade embargo lifted, all of a sudden De digital got tons of orders from Russia because people really wanted the good, high-quality version of digital instead of the, the cheap, you know, copied one. So, you know, in a way it's, and I'm sure, you know, Microsoft knows that there are tons of copies of their products throughout China uh, and uh, illegal copies even here in the U.S. Interesting. Thank you. It looks like we have another question. Please, sir. Yeah, let me be an example that you're never too old to learn. Thank you for sharing your time. <laughs> sure. This, this may be a loaded question. If you and your husband disagree, who dominates <laughs> the decision? <laughs> Uh, you know, that's, that's interesting. We have different areas that we focus on. So he's very much more on the budgeting and accounting and finance side. And I'm on the product and development side. So I think we, uh, we might have opinions, but we pretty much respect each other's area. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been 30 years and, and we, haven't, we haven't had any real disagreements. So. And I think that's part of um, having a good working team and partnership and trusting each other and everybody in our management team to do, to do what they're supposed to do. May I add a comment? Lots of time our personal attitude affects our decision. If you're a woman and you think that you're going to be abused or mistreated, you will be. I remember <laughs> when I first got into the real estate business, it was, you know, I was very young. I was only 31 years of age. And uh, finally, a client came up to me and said, do you realize why we stay with you, you being so young? I said, I have no idea. I never gave it a thought. I just, you know, I just did the best I could. He said, the good book says a child shall lead you. And that stopped me from that point on. It's your attitude that's going to be the barrier between you and your success. Don't let it stop yeah. you. If somebody doesn't like you because of your gender, it is their problem, not yours. And yeah, and then you just go find another client. So you know, and if they, you know, I, you know, not everybody. And everyone has prejudices. Everybody, uh, you know, whether we talk about them or not, you're not supposed to say anything about. Oh well, if you're tall, you probably play basketball, and if you're short, you probably can't jump. You know, I mean, there's different prejudices that people have, and you just keep moving on. 
Uh, and that shows through in terms of being together for 30 years, that's uh, indeed. <laughs> um, let's shift a little bit and talk a little bit about management, if we could. You mentioned something the other day about standing shoulder to shoulder with the fo people in your mm -hmm. organization. Can you please share with the audience today what you well, mean by that? Well, I think that? there's different types of management, and I always call it the traditional, um, you know, mid-America, Rust Belt kind of manufacturing attitude, and we have a lot of those as customers. Uh, and there tends to be really uh, hard, aggressive, command and control people at the leadership, you know. I've decided this is what we're doing. I want you to do this and you to do this, and there's no, you know, there's no conversation. Um, our attitude is uh, quite a bit different, and maybe it's because we're a tech uh, company that has a lot of very, very smart people in it, but I think it has more to do with attitude. I always look at as my management team as part of the team, and I'm just a player in the team, and we, uh, as I had stated, I go our shoulder and shoulder out to, you know, to fight our battles, not, not me leading everybody and telling them what to do because they have um, great ideas and and, uh, mo and many of them, most of them maybe even, are much smarter than I am, particularly in their areas. So we respect each other's areas. So it's more of a team and I don't, um, we don't have, uh, uh, you know, multiple levels of organization with command and control type um, leaders. So was your management style something that was natural to you, or was this something you conscientiously worked at being? I think it, it was our personality. I actually, I think it was an innate personality. And how did that then translate into the culture of your company? I think that, that the culture of a company is, becomes the personality of, of the founders, particularly if the founders stay in the company for a long time. And I'll go back, our first, um, our first real partner was Hewlett Packard. And when we were selling with Hewlett Packard, uh, Dave and Bill were still there. And it was a very much of an engineering company. And it was what they called management by walking around, which is basically what I do. But uh, they, um, they used to go around and talk to all the engineers and brainstorm ideas. And it was a very engineering kind of collaborative company. Um, and then about, what, 10 years ago, uh, it went through a couple, um, uh, John Young, when he was CEO, uh, uh, Bill and um, Hill and Packard were still there, Bill and Dave were still there, but kind of he was the CEO and they were in the offices kind of coaching them what to do. Um, and then they hired uh, Carly, um, Carly Farina, is that her name? Yeah. Farina. Uh, and um, she was a whole different person. She came from AT&T, and it was all about marketing, and it wasn't necessarily connected to reality. And I remember the first quarter, they announced that they had exceeded earnings, you know, two weeks ahead of time, you know, pre-announced, we exceeded earnings, everything's great, we've exceeded earnings. Uh, and then when they finally did announce and post their, their financial they exceeded earnings by selling real estate. You know, that was just not right. And that was just not something that Hewlett Packard would ever do. Normally, Hewlett Packard would never pre announce one way or the other. They would just, you know, lay out their financial statements and say, this is what happened, and, you know, good or bad. And so she was trying to really create a lot of energy and a lot of momentum. But it was like, it was, you know, I mean, basically a lie, if not, you know, just completely, you know, just not right. It was, it was misleading. So their stock went up on this pre announcement, and then she finally announced, and the stock tanked. Thanks, uh, because it wasn't truthful. And so I think that she was wrong personality for Hewlett Packard, whether she mm -hmm. ended up doing anything right or not. It, she set that tone and it wasn't, it's, it was contrary to that personality. Mm -hmm. um, looking back over 30 years, what would you, what do you think is maybe your greatest success as a manager and maybe the area where you weren't so successful? Um, certainly success, you'd have to say, you know, we, we've grown from zero to $250 million um, and uh, we've uh, led a good life for a lot of, and for a lot of all of our employees, our 1,500 employees and for our customers. So I think the community has been very successful. Uh, people have been very successful using our software and we've been successful and well rewarded for that. Uh, probably our biggest blind spot uh, in the um, 
late 90s, you know, 90, we were growing very, very fast. Um, and I just had this, this mindset that I could not more.